What an honor to have these few moments with you. How moving to receive these words of challenge uh, from our general superintendents from across the globe. And to stand with these wonderful leaders who serve as general officers and the general board. As those moments went by, for the most part, um, I was very attentive to what's going on. Up until the point uh, Dr. Lyon raised this gavel, and for a moment I wasn't sure what was coming next. Uh, I was glad to hear it develop the way that it did. I think we realize that North America is increasingly becoming a mission field and that the contrast between the culture around us and the church that we serve will likely only grow in the days ahead. I had so many wonderful opportunities in service to Wesley Seminary to meet a variety of groups that we might serve nationally and internationally. And I was intrigued one day to meet the North American Bishop of the Missionary Diocese of the uh, Trinity, which is a Nigerian Anglican group. Their diocese is located in Indianapolis, and Nigeria has sent missionaries to North America in order to reach North America for Christ. And in particular, these individuals felt like the Anglican church that most of North America was experiencing had become so absorbed in the culture that it was no longer fully reflecting Christ. Now, I have no way of discerning whether their assessment is completely right, but I was struck by the fact that we are a mission field. And as I think about that, I also believe that we are uniquely positioned by God based on what we believe, based on the history that he has entrusted to us, to fully engage in this mission. This is not the time to shrink back. This is the time to step forward. This is the time to engage as never before because along with the contrast that's developing, I am convinced there will be a corresponding hunger and thirst deep in the hearts of people as the other things they seek no longer satisfy. But as we engage this mission field, let me call you, if I might, to two things. One is over this next season, I would ask that you would join me in focused prayer. I am so grateful that at the center of the seven missional priorities Dr. Lyon established is focused prayer. I grew up in the Pilgrim Holiness and later Wesleyan Church. I've always been impressed that our movement has been marked by fervent prayer. I can remember Wednesday prayer meetings as a child when I wasn't crawling under the pews, kneeling and hearing people pour out their hearts to God. As Dr. Lyon observed, sometimes those prayers were repetitive. Sometimes those prayers included mentions of body parts I wasn't sure as a kid were appropriate to bring up in public. But sometimes those prayers had great fervency but lacked focus on the things closest to the heart of God. So as I visit the district conferences and those who also serve with me in that role, I will be calling our church through those district conferences, the hundreds and thousands that will gather in those conferences, to join with me in focused prayer for the mission that is yet ahead of us. Church, let me issue a warning to you. Have you ever noticed that prayer groups often become seedbeds of criticism? Sometimes when we are seeking God, he gives us unique insights. He helps us to see the strengths and weaknesses of the church. 
He gives us those insights for intercession, but sometimes people have violated the stewardship of those insights, and rather than using them for intercession, they use them for criticism. So we must be careful that the enemy doesn't rob us of a gift I believe God's going to give us in these next 50 to 100 days as we focus in prayer. And that is he will reveal to us the specific ways in which we must change, we must adapt, we must be steady as we pursue this mission. And may we always return them to him in prayer rather than return them in gossip or criticism to others. The second priority that comes to us with some urgency, also mentioned by my predecessor, Dr. Lyon, in giving a general superintendent executive order last night, is the area of discipleship. Like so many ways, she has set a precedent by giving an executive order as a general superintendent. I'll have to weigh whether it's wise for any other general superintendent to follow that precedent. I mean no disrespect for her executive order, but it strikes me there's one that has precedence even over her executive order. We often don't call it an executive order, we call it the Great Commission. We are to go and to make disciples of all nations, all people groups, ta ethne, all ethnicities. Have you noticed the nations are our neighbors? Jan and I currently live in Marion, Indiana. We live in the most international neighborhood we've ever lived in, in Marion, Indiana. So it's not just a matter of around the world, as significant as that is, as we serve and learn from the global church, but it's also our own neighborhoods. Go and make disciples. There's been so many observations based on this verse. I only offer briefly a couple simple things. One is when at the end of Matthew, Jesus said, go and make disciples. I don't think he was thinking or the writers were thinking, you know, I've went on for 28 chapters. This is the longest book of the four gospels. I better wrap this thing up and bring it in for a landing and I better end with a flourish. So I'm going to give the Great Commission. I think he meant it. It was meant to be a command, a commission. It is non-optional if we're his body, his church. The second is, while I love teaching, I love learning, that's been my world for the last several years, sometimes we view making disciples only in terms of what fills the head. But I am convinced that we've only made a disciple when they, in turn, make a disciple. Disciples making disciples. Again, let me be cautious here, but strong. Sometimes our discipleship programs don't make disciples, they make Pharisees. They only make people with more knowledge in their head, and we know what knowledge apart from love and engagement and transformation and reaching out beyond our preferences and comfort zones to bring other people to Christ. We know what that knowledge alone tends to do. It creates Pharisees rather than disciples. We're to go and make disciples. So in light of the executive order Dr. Lyon gave and the Great Commission our Lord and Savior gave, we believe that the best ideas for discipleship are right out here and across our church. And if you're taking notes, I'd love you to write something down. It's spiritual formation at wesleyan.org. It's an email address. And we believe there are amazing things happening in discipleship, but we're often unaware of them. 
and they're happening in churches of 50 and 100 and 200 and 500 and 5,000. And that's important because discipleship doesn't necessarily look the same in every context, in every church situation or size. So what we're going to do is build a way that ideas can be received and then as people respond to those ideas, again from across the church, we'll have a sense of which are most helpful and important for the whole of the body. So let me give it to you again. If you're involved in a discipleship program, your church, and you say, I think others may benefit from it, no matter what your church size, spiritual formation at wesleyan.org. Let me conclude by saying this. It is so fun being a Wesleyan. Now, I've served in a seminary where 40% of our students were Wesleyan, 60% come from 40 other denominations. I'm not a person who believes that our denomination is it and everybody ought to be a part of it. I think the Catholic, ironic spirit of Wesley needs to live on. We recognize our many callings and God expresses his body in different ways. The reason I love being a Wesleyan is as I hear people talk about the mission that needs to be engaged and extended in the years ahead, I hear them saying things like, we need to become more apostolic. We, we need to return to the days of the New Testament when people were getting a vision for a whole territory and multiplying churches to fulfill that territory. Or they're saying things like, we need more networks. We need more associations, not just denominations. Or we need more of a Pentecostal passion and power. Or we need something more than behavior modification. We need true transformation. You know why that makes me smile? This is our DNA, people. Did you know we were once called the Apostolic Holiness Union? Did you know on the grave of John Wesley are the words apostolic doctrine and practice? Do you realize one of our early formative founders preached a whole message series on the ideal Pentecostal church? Do you realize it wasn't the word association or network, but early a part of us were called the Wesleyan Methodist Connection? We do not have to become something we're not to engage in this mission. My friends, we must become who we've always been, who God created us to be, and find new ways of reimagining this unique part of the body of Christ that already has in its DNA all that we need, the Holy Spirit being our power and strength. May it be so. In Jesus' name, amen.